Hey, I worked, for, <laughs> I worked for 15 years in a shop, I mean, in a dealership with no lift. You know why I didn't like having a lift? Because the lift gets in the way. It does. Yeah, Beat you know, when I was putting a fuel pump on a tempo, I would jack that thing up and throw a stand under it. Just one corner of it. Jack it up, throw a stand under it, woo, woo, let the thing just fall and let it hang by the hoses. And then I would take that stuff loose and knock that thing out. And I could change that pump in about 30 minutes. Uh, Even with gas in it. Unless it was slim full, you know. I mean, then you just use the jack to support the thing, putting it back up there. I mean, you, you do what works. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what you stay safe. You don't want to blow yourself up. That's why you put a jack stand under it. You wear safety glasses. Here's something else. Changing the fuel pump in a motorhome. Uh, motor homes come in there, need a fuel pump, they'd have an 80-gallon gas tank full of gas. 80 gallons. We had nothing at the dealership where I worked that would hold 80 gallons of gas. I mean, it sounds good. Hey, why don't you just pump the gas up? But where the sound hill are you going to put it? We ain't got three, you know, or two 55-gallon drums that we can put gas in, and you got to pump it back in there. So what I did was I devised a way to lower the thing and, uh, you know, do it. But on some of them, you could reach over the top of the tank. There was a there was a... Between the frame, the tank was mounted low enough where you could reach over the top and get your hands on all that stuff and you could change it that way. What's the problem with that? You got your face stuck up in this area where all these gas fumes are. And if you're not real careful, you're breathing gas fumes. Well, that ain't good. You're killing brain cells, right? So what I did was I got a big old squirrel cage fan that I got bought off the tool truck, you know, that sits in there and blows. And you can get these at blows or whatever now. And I would put it there so that it was constantly having a really strong draft Blowing those gas fumes out the other way. And then I'd get my, there was actually bolts that held the, the tank, the, the big uh, plate for the tank was built. And I would spin those out of there, you know, and get that thing changed out. But these, anytime you're looking, let's listen to this now. This is important for engine performance stuff. I'm going to burn this in. Uh, you got one that you feel like is, they say it's cutting up like, uh, I've got a video on my YouTube channel about this. Uh, you hook to get the fuel gauge up. And you're reading, like, say, 30 pounds, right? Now, some of them read more than that. you got to know what your specs are for the car. You pull the fuel pressure regulator hose, unless it's returnless, and that's going to be a slightly different deal. You pull that off there, and with the, th the uh, uh, fuel pressure is going to go up about 10 pounds, usually, when you pull a vacuum line off the fuel pressure gauge, fuel pressure regulator. And you watch that gas pressure, and you snap the throttle. What should the gas pressure, what should the fuel pressure do? Shoot now up. you've got to, it should stay the same because <laughs> you've got the you've got the vacuum line pulled off the fuel pressure. He wasn't wrong if the vacuum line's on the fuel pressure regulator. Mm -hmm. If you have a fuel pressure regulator with a vacuum line on it, you're going to pull that off. That pressure ought to go up about 10 pounds roughly, and it always it's always going to increase about 10 pounds if you take the vacuum away. You snap the throttle, the pressure should never go down. It should always either stay the same. You know, well, typically it's going to go up if you've got your vacuum line hooked up. If it's pulled off, it's going to stay the same. Now, what we were doing on Ben's truck, Ben's truck wouldn't, you know, run right. It would get hot, worse and worse when it got hotter. He'd cut up, pop, and snort, and cut up. Ben was here before you came. All right, so we've snapped his throttle, and the pressure dropped. I'd see that on motorhomes. People would come in on their motorhomes, and they'd say, uh, we lose power, we cut out, and we, they, we've got it full of gas, but it still does it and all that. Well, that's great that you got it full of gas, because i go out there, I'd pop the engine cover off while they were watching, because, you know, you're going into somebody's house when you go in a motorhome, and it usually smells like dogs, because they've always got dogs in there, you know. So you pop the engine cover off, you find a fuel pressure tap, put it on there with a gauge, pull the fuel pressure uh, off, whoom, snap the throttle, and you see a loose pressure, and needs a fuel pump, and you're done. Now, the fuel pressure, I mean, the fuel filter can cause this, but usually they've already changed that. See what I'm saying? Okay, so if the fuel filter's new and the gas tank's not contaminated, it's about 99 times out of 100, you're going to have a bad fuel pump. And if you've made your diagnosis, by the way, listen to this, y'all, the diagnosis pays an hour, and it took you eight minutes to do it. Yeah. Even yeah. if they don't want it done, so you still get paid an hour's time. That's what, that's what the whole deal is about that. Okay, let's get in our test so we can get moving on this. And uh, I spent four minutes and 47 seconds telling you a war story. Yep. Yep. That's not good, is it? Yeah, we're, we're supposed to be moving faster than this. All right, let's get in. The, let's get our act together here, and we're going to go. Cylinder compression is the low pressure condition created as the crankshaft turns, pulling the rod and piston down in the cylinder. No. Okay. Uh, that. What is that? It's false. That's false. Cylinder compression. When, when does cylinder compression happen? When it goes up the top. On what stroke does compression happen? Oh, the compression stroke. <laughs> and you got both valves closed? 
and you're headed up. Now, the cranking vacuum test measures engine vacuum while the engine is cranking. Right? Mm -hmm. What should it be? When you're spinning it over, not when it's running, when you're spinning it over, what should it be? Zero? Shouldn't it? Doesn't it need to pull some air in there? That's if the true. throttle plate's closed and those pistons are moving, you're going to be creating low pressure in that intake, and it's supposed to be about two or three inches of mercury. Oh, that's not very much. Which is two or three inches of vacuum. Inches of mercury. Inches HG, you see that on your gauge? HG is mercury. You know, and that's the way that it was calibrated. We're using mercury and sea level in a graduated tube and all that stuff. I usually draw a picture on the board. But usually whenever I start telling you how they came up with that, everybody's glad, eyes glaze over. Yeah, all right. So, uh, <laughs> well, Archie, that's normal for you. <laughs> Why did they use mercury? Huh? They used mercury because it's nice and heavy. They've also, you've also got water <coughs> vacuum, which water vacuum numbers are a heck of a lot different from mercury vacuum numbers. Mercury vacuum numbers are more manageable. You know, using water vacuum would be like a real higher resolution measurement, which is not really necessary. All right, somebody tell me what engine vacuum is supposed to be on a healthy engine with the engine idling. I don't know. Mine's around 20. Huh? Mine's around 20. 18 to 22 is what you're looking for. If you got low engine vacuum, there's some reasons that for that. Um, if the dry compression test results in a low reading and the wet compression test is nor near normal, there may be worn piston rings. If the dry compression test results in a low reading and the wet compression test is near normal, there may be worn piston rings. Do y'all, does anybody not know what a wet compression test is? You, yeah, you're going to check your compression on every cylinder with the throttle blocked wide open and all the plugs out. Right? Write all those numbers down. And then you're going to go back with your, if you got, let's say that you've got Good compression on uh, five of the cylinders if it's a six, and one of them, like cylinder number two, like the rest of them, well, I'm reading 160, and cylinder number two is reading 100 pounds. It's way lower than the rest of them. And you think, there's a problem here, and I'm getting a misfire on cylinder number two with my scan tool. So I need to know what's going on here. Okay, so you take about a teaspoon of oil. You know, you know about, I mean, your, your oil squirt gun that you keep in your toolbox. you got motor oil in it, and you put a hose on it, and you stick it down in the spark plug hole, and you go... You know, don't get any motor oil on the spark plug threads because it'll have a tendency to turn into sticky brown stuff and the plugs won't, don't want to come out. So don't put motor oil on your spark plug threads, okay? It's a bad idea. Uh, Squirt a couple of, of uh, puffs down there, spin the engine over without the gauge in there, and let the oil get, you know, stirred up and get to where it's helping the piston ring seal. Put your gauge back in there and recheck it. If the pressure comes up to normal, that means the rings are the problem. If the pressure stays the same, you got valve troubles. Uh, you can also have a hole in a piston or something, but you don't even know, that, you know what I'm saying. How often you know, do you get a hole in a piston? It, uh, burn, it burns it in there. I mean, you can actually have a uh, cylinder that runs so high it can burn a hole in a piston. Now, you may surprise, the more engines you tear down, the more crazy stuff you'll see. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you're if you're going Mach 2 with your hair on fire all the time like Wes is on the weekend. <laughs> all, right. all right, now, the... Uh, the most common causes of low compression involve rings, pistons, cylinder walls, valves, or the head gasket. That's true. That's pretty much true, yeah. So we got one false and three truths so far, right? Okay. The first one was false. The first one was false. Is your eyes glazed over yet? Look at him. He's having a... I'm doing this open book, giving him the answers, and he still has to copy something. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. Uh, all right. Knowing the history of the complaint and looking up the service history are both part of the diagnostic strategy. Guys, whenever we're working on something that somebody's bringing in, it has to be diagnosed. I see a lot of the work that comes in is just maintenance work. You know, check the brakes, look at this, look at that, make sure my belts and hoses are okay, change my oil and all that. I mean, you're going to have some. If you're working at a small place, don't get ticked off if they give you a lot of oil changes because they do a lot of oil changes in a small shop and everybody does them. You know what I mean? In a bigger shop, usually they'll have people that specialize in oil changes. <laughs> Now, the people that, uh, they do, seriously. They have people that actually have oil. They, these guys are the, the guys with the minimum amount of skill, and they change oil, and that's all they do. I couldn't do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you I could, but you just don't want to. Yeah. 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 Oh, I don't want to change oil. Yeah, man. I like, I like feeling like I did something good because I see this dirty stuff coming out, carrying the contaminants with it, and I put clean oil back in, you know. And I get to replace <laughs> yeah, the oil drain plug if the threads are straight a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I changed that oil probably. Uh, I had to say 10,000 miles. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, well, it's the Ford, you know. That's what. I'm... All right. <laughs> I don't mind if I change my oil. It looks just as bad as the stuff coming out. Yep. Remember the guy I told you about? Remember the guy I told you about that didn't even know anything about vehicles, but he changed his oil over fifteen hundred miles, and he told me that his timing chain broke when he had about four hundred something thousand on it. <laughs> You know, he had a ton of miles. There was a plain old 350 Chevrolet. He never had to put a range on that thing for 450,000 miles because he changed the oil over 1,500 miles. He didn't know when he was supposed to change it. He just figured it was a long time ago with the same oil, so he changed it over 1,500. His name was Edmund Harris, and he worked with me down at Sabine. I, I knew that guy personally, you know, but anyway. 450,000 miles. 450,000 miles, and the timing chain broke. He's not good. Yeah, bent every valve in it. For the timing chain broke. Bent every valve in it? Bent every valve in it when the timing chain broke. The crank chain still going, the timing chain Whipped off of there. Boom. Well, your model's there. Oh, it was like a 74. Uh, yeah. Something cool. like one of... Uh, it was actually a GMC. Yeah. Yeah. I like what we got on the stand there. That's an 88 model out there, though. Um, all right. Now, let's see. Now, we got to know what I started to say. you got to be a detective. When you're talking to somebody, what, I, what you'll hear, what you hear me ask sometimes when I'm talking to a customer that comes up out here, I'll say, uh, they'll say, my car is doing this, this, and this, you know. And I'll say, did it just start doing this, or has it been doing it for a while? They say, well, I say, did it come on gradually, or did it all of a sudden you driving it running good one day and the next day? Does it only happen when the engine is cold? Does it only happen when the engine is hot? Does it happen whenever you're uh, on rainy days? You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you got to drag that information out of them. You see what I mean? And there's one guy had his pickup truck he brought over there. And it had a uh, two tanks on it. So uh, the trucks, he, he loads it off of his trailer. He's a farmer. And it's a pretty nice truck, you know. And uh, so I get in it, and I look, and it's on the front gas tank. And so I go, and it says, aha, now I need to see if it's got spark. So I get out here. I'm under the hood, you know. You know how you get up on the hood with your knees up on the radiator support and your butt up in the air? You know how you do when you're working on a truck? If you ain't got a, you know. So I'm up here, and I'm checking. I said, okay, I'm going to spin this thing over with my starter button, which I hooked up to the solenoid over there. And uh, as I was checking the spark, I was just letting it jump to the center of the trigger cap. And boom, 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 boom. I fired up. Oh, man. So I fooled that doggone thing for, you know, it, it, you know, for probably a day and off and on trying to get it to react to that. And no, I never would do anything. I said, well, I don't know what to do with this son of a gun. So anyway, we, uh, he came to pick it up. And so... Uh, he came walking back in before he even got out the gate on it. He goes, that thing quit before I got to the gate. And I said, really? Well, let me go out here and see. And so uh, I went out here and I, and I looked at that switch and it was still on the front tank. Right? And it goes, -na 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 for about 40 seconds and then it goes, fired up. I said, let me guess what happened here. I said, you got in the truck and you pulled out and you switched to the rear tank. Didn't you? Yeah, and the engine quit, and then I switched it back to the front tank, and it still wouldn't start. He had water in the back tank, mm. and I says, let me, "Let me ask you this: What happened out there on the road when it quit on you in the country?" He said, "Oh, I switched to the rear tank, and it quit, and then I switched back to the front tank, and it still wouldn't start." <laughs> well, see, you had to push all that water out of the rail, and I was pushing the water out of the rail when I was first checking it out the parking lot. But see, the thing about it is, he didn't tell me that. He didn't say that was a significant piece of information. It always quits when I switch it to the rear tank. Duh. And I said, let me show you a trick, everybody. So I held it up to about 2,500 RPM. And I switched it to the rear tank. And it went, ooh. And I switched it back to the front. And it goes, boom, 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 Came back. Bingo. You get water in the back tank. And those pancake-shaped back tanks like to have condensation because a lot of times people use the front tank and let the back tank stay empty. And a lot of condensation likes to form in an empty gas tank and it just gathers in the bottom of the tank. You see? So you wind up having to clean that tank. Anyway, the fact you, is, you got not, you got to ask pertinent questions and stay focused on the goal. Now, Brandon would probably make a pretty good service writer, too, because he's got the personality for it. You know what I mean? He, he's real confrontational. <laughs> you know, I can just see him calling somebody, just got a Thunderbird or something, say, fixing your air conditioner and your power windows is going to cost $1,700. you got to have it. No two ways about it. <laughs> okay, now then, uh, let's see. But you got to know the history of the complaint and look up the service history. Pull the folder and look and see what you see. You know what I'm saying? And you're, if you say, 
Uh, well, remember the one I told you about in the transmission problem? Uh, they gave it to me, and they said, this thing's got a surge. And I drove it. It was one of these little Mitsubishi cars that we had. It was an Eagle, you know, Talon or whatever. And I'm driving it, and I feel a surge. I say, you know, that feels just like that when they had a surge that needed the transmission fluid change because it didn't have any friction modifier in it. And whenever the torque converter clutch was only partially locked, it would surge. So I went and pulled the repair history, and Kevin Sherwood, our man, had serviced the transmission on it about six weeks earlier, and he put the wrong kind of fluid in it. Gee, what? Now, I could have worked on that thing all day looking for a surge, but I went and pulled the service history, and because of that, I was done with it, and it went back to him, and he had to put the right kind of fluid in it. See what I'm saying? All right. Now then. And what did you get paid for that? Uh, I got paid for the, for the diagnostics on it. Oh, okay. But uh, the way they were paying me at that point, they were actually paying me. Most of the time I worked over there, they were paying me salary plus commission. I mean, so I did a lot of stuff that I didn't get flagged for. Like I would fix all the battery chargers and blow the dust out of the computers, and I put the fans that used to be sitting on stands and mounted up on the wall so that everybody would always have their same fan. I did a lot of stuff over. If you go to the Ford place over in Dothan and you look at this big banner that they got up there about uh, getting about the employee handling vision and the customer handling vision, you know, every customer will know with each visit that we will be able to. I wrote that. Huh. And uh, but I mean, so I, the thing about it is. Uh, you can you can leave your mark on whatever place you work if you go in there with the right attitude. And then like, you're a team player, you know, and that, that's what I try to be. Um, uh, I'll tell you something else. You know, the, this guy that was working on commission over there that was turning lots of hours, he'd been there a long, long time. And they took him off commission, and they put him on the clock, and he quit working. Why? <laughs> it just slowed down to a crawl because he didn't have to worry about turning down a lot of hours to make his money. <laughs> See what I'm saying? And that makes it bad for the rest of us. I mean, I was earning what I was getting paid, you know. But I mean, that guy right there, I never expected him to slow down and, you know, get lazy whenever they took him off the mission. That's bad. Anyway, yeah. Uh, and, you know, but there's some people who earn their money no matter how they get paid. All right. And um, let's see. Um, okay, so five is true. The first step in isolating a vibration problem is to run the engine at idle when the vehicle stopped. The first step in isolating a vibration problem is to run the engine at idle with the vehicle stopped. Well, what kind of vibration is it? Exactly. I mean, you know, I mean, are you going to, uh, typically, what well, most vibrations that you're going to see, now they're talking engine. We're talking engine uh, principles, right? Uh, you're not typically going to feel a vibration when it's idling like you are at the higher speeds. Okay, how fast does the alternator spin? Not fast enough. Uh, Please, Archie. Oh, really? <laughs> well, how do we figure that out? Think about it now. It's important to come up with this answer. I don't really you need to know how fast the alternator spins. What are you going to do? How big is the crankshaft pulley? Yeah. You're going to have to measure it. How, how big is it on that uh, navigator that you're putting the head back on? Pretty big. Pretty big. Well, like 10 inches? Uh, diameter. Eight. Eight. About, eight inch, about 8 inches in diameter. Yeah. Okay, if the alternator pulley is 3 inches in diameter... Well, let's let's do it easy. Let's say the let's say the crankshaft pulley is nine inches in diameter, and the alternator pulley is three inches in diameter. The alternator is going to turn three times as fast as the engine. So if you're turning the engine at three thousand RPM, the alternator is turning at nine. And if you've got a vibration analyzer on there, and you're picking up something, it's nine thousand hertz. You see, at three thousand RPM, if you're picking up something, it's you know, 9,000, yeah. you know, you kind of got an idea where you need to go. I went to a vibration, noise vibration harshness school at Ford, and he would put, we had a machine, it would, a vibration analyzer, and he would put, put a bunch of washers on one of, behind one of the bolts on the torque converter and make a vibration. <laughs> <laughs> we had to figure that out. I mean, you know, and it was something else. And it, you'd be surprised how that vibration analyzer, you just put that little sensor on the sun visor or something, whatever's wiggling, mm -hmm. and it'll give you numbers so you'll know whether it's a first, second, or third order vibration. You know how fast everything's turning at every speed and all that kind of oh, stuff. I mean, this is, this is something you'd never think about having to do. Why do I not have a vibration analyzer here? They cost too much money. Uh, and, uh, you're probably not going to see one at whatever shop you go to anyway. They're expensive as all get out. I mean, you, you can pay through the news. When we get in our drive line, and I'm going to be going through a, dry, uh, uh, pers I mean, a uh, presentation on finding vibrations and noises and stuff. Here a little but okay. Not that's going to be, that may be tomorrow, but I'm not sure. Oh, gee. Uh, yay. All right. So, let me see here. Um, okay, so six is actually going to be false. That's not the first step. The rotating mass of an engine includes the pistons, connecting rods, except for the large end, 
piston except rings. Uh, huh? Except for the larger ones. Well, the uh, connected rod has got a big end and a little end. Oh, okay. okay, okay. That, that's the big end. That's the little end. The little end is where the wrist pin is. Oh, oh because yeah. the large end is going to turn with the large end is moving on the crankshaft. You know, crank yeah. The top oh. end is doing what? It's going up and down. So it's not actually moving around and around. All right. So include the crankshaft. The rotating mass includes the pistons, connecting rods, except for the large end, piston rings and piston pins. That is absolutely false. You know the rotating, the pistons aren't rotating; they're reciprocating. What does that mean? Yeah, going up and down. You take a reciprocating motion and you convert it into circular motion. Why is why is your uh, why does your engine have to go around and around? What? Huh? <laughs> because everything is round. Uh, the wheels that? are round. <laughs> yeah, the wheels are round. And the drive shaft is round. Everything's round, so it has to go round and round. Hey, Wes was totally black <laughs> flabber yesterday. <laughs> All right, we're, I'm, I'm going to hurry, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm just having fun this morning. I'm kind of wired. I haven't, I haven't really had that much coffee either. Hmm. Chelsea made it. That's why. All right. A cylinder, <laughs> a cylinder leakage test applies pressure to the cylinder through the spark plug hole. That is true. You're going to screw a hose in there. It's got spark plug, 14 millimeter spark plug threads on it. And you're going to put, what was that perplexed look you gave me a second ago? <laughs> but uh, every now and then Brandon makes strange looks, and I don't know what's driving him. What right, yeah. All, right, yeah. All right, so he did that a lot when you were working with him yesterday, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. He said, ch -ch 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 -ch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, you were doing all the work, he was doing all the texting. Yeah, huh? he does. Well, he was keeping his girlfriend up to speed with everything. <laughs> He's taking out the torque converter ball. He's taking out. Okay. Yeah. You go, Brandon. All right. I told you, put his cell phone away so many times when he was playing. Yeah. Was it nothing? How many times did he tell you? A lot. Probably about five to ten, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you can, you can avoid that by not pulling it out today. Okay. All you have to do is, the only way to make him work is to tell him to do something. <laughs> that is the only way you can make him do something. <laughs> you got to give him a job will, to if do. If you do all the work for him, he'll sit over there and text the whole time. Yeah, well, that's a good plan. You are learning how to be a supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he's the one that got that big, ugly job, see? All right, a die kit. That's why he dropped the freaking seven million. Yeah, he, got, he made some money. <laughs> a die kit and ultraviolet light may be used to locate external oil and coolant leaks. True. That is absolutely correct. Uh, you got different dye for all antifreeze, refrigerant. I mean, there's all different kinds of dye. And like I say, this guy, that guy gets up. an average compression pressure during cranking is between 50 uh, and 100 psi. Oh, that's false. What do you typically look for on compression? When you're doing a compression test, what are you looking for? At least 150. 150 psi. At least. <laughs> At least 150. It depends on the, if the engine is overall kind of worn out and they're all running on about 125, you'll be okay. Um, yeah, they've got to be all almost even. Even, yeah. You don't you don't want to bunt some over here, you know, some up here and some down here. You can actually, believe it or not, check the compression uh, by looking at the uh, cylinder whenever you hook the uh, this current ramping clamp up out here with this scope that we got. Mm -hmm. You can go around the starter cable and you can look on the screen. It'll give you compression pulses. Uh, and if really? amp, yeah, because the amps increase when you're squeezing current. So you can, it's cool looking little pattern that you get that way. Oh. Um, hey, there's the uniform man. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the new uniform man? No. You hear about, you're not here by yourself today? Oh, I am the boss up today, but Todd's just out. Oh, okay. Back. Well, is he sick or something? Uh, I think that's about his point. Oh, well, if he did, he should have. That's all I got to say. All right. Hold on a minute. Let me get you some of them. Put those, uh, put those on my desk. Okay. Get on my hand, please. Thank you very much, sir. Did you see my uniform down there? Yes, sir. And I appreciate that. And then rags, too. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, the, the blank test evaluates individual cylinder performance by disabling one cylinder at a time and noting RPM drop. What now? The blank test. Blank test. Yeah, that's hey, number eleven. This thing, Mr. The number eleven, right? Yeah, the blank in the answer. <laughs> the A, B, C, or D. The A, B, C, or D test. Okay. A, cylinder compression. B, cylinder leakage. C, cylinder power balance. Power balance. power balance is what you're after. 
If I've got an engine that's misfiring to begin with, and I know the spark is good, and I know it's got a good clean plug in it, and I know it's got injector to that, I'm going to pop a vacuum gauge on it, and I'm going to see if that vacuum gauge is bouncing. If it is, we got valve problems. That's just all there's to it. It's pretty easy to do. Like, you know, when I was doing, uh, doing this drivability and electronic stuff over there, I was, if I, they brought a, one in there that was skipping, you know, I'd pop a vacuum gauge on it. If I saw it bouncing, they, you know, I'd say, hey, this thing needs a, I'm going to pull the heads off and all that. They'd send it down the line and they'd, you know, take it the rest of the way. A written electronic record for this vehicle is known as a... C or C or D? Number 12, what's that now? C? Or D. Yeah, it's a C. Service history. D. What do you mean D? D computer, <laughs> computer aided diagnosis? Well, I mean, you got it on the computer and you're written on the computer. Oh. We used to have an MS-1700 tester we used on those Renaults and those older Jeeps and AMC cars. And they would send you through all of these things. They'd ask you questions, and you'd check what they said, and hit yes, no, yes, no, a little screen with blue words on it. And after they went all the way through, if you'd say yes, yes, no, 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 yes, 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 no, no, when you got through, if that thing failed to give you the answer and figure out what was wrong, it would say, it would give you this blanket response. It would say, engine failed to start due to fuel, mechanical, or ignition problems. <laughs> but we knew that already. See what I'm saying? <laughs> all right. All right, now then, let's see. Uneven reading on the cranking vacuum test may indicate that. Uh, number, what is that now? 13. Number 13. An uneven reading on the cranking vacuum test may indicate that. Is that right? Maybe if there's a. It says uh, B, according to the answer key, is the. Uh, there's an air leak into one or more cylinders. What do you think? Yeah, That's a cranking vacuum <laughs> test. The valve timing is oh. incorrect. You know, well, you could have valve timing that was incorrect, but that's typically it won't even start up then. But you're looking for engine health. Uh, or, well, I say that valve timing can be mildly incorrect and it may still start up and run crappy. Um, camshaft timing is incorrect. That would be like valve timing being incorrect. Look at that. Both those are the same kind of answer, aren't they? You know, the belt. timing belt has failed. That could all, those three could all, those three would all be the same thing. I have, seen vehicles that would jump two or three teeth uh, on the timing belt and still run. Really? Yeah. And, and not jump any more than two or three. Now, I was Toyota Camry, 80, 90, no, 87 model that I had. You did jump three and, teeth and ran I mean, that I was working on. Three teeth, and it was still running. But right. I drove it all the way from Level Plains to Dothan. So it ran good? It didn't run good, but it ran. That was the reason I was driving it. The reason I was driving it because it didn't run good. Oh, okay. And then whenever I looked at it, it was slightly out of time. Uh, but anyway, the, this question is a bad question. I don't like that question, the right answer. Go ahead and put B on there and you'll get that one right. But if I was seeing that, you will not see a question that is that vague on the ASC test. And just about every time you see a question on the ASC test, the answers are black and white. What I mean by that is you've got some really good answers and you've got some really bad answers. You've got one really good answer and you've got three really bad ones. And you have the ability to, the way that they put those questions together is they get a whole panel of people from all the manufacturers and, you know, the people that are considered experts in the field. They tried to hire me one time, but I wasn't able to go up there. Why? Because I was just started this job and the dean of instruction, you know, I hadn't been here for like a month. And she didn't want to turn me loose for two or three days to go up there to, and they were going to pay me like $200 a day and uh, pay for my hotel and all that kind of stuff. You're <laughs> But I mean, I've well, already been riding for motor age long enough. I know, you, I know, that's what I was saying. You get right. Yeah, I was riding for motor age. They'd seen me write tests before because I used to put a test in me. But anyway, they wanted me to do that. And that was the one time I had a chance to do that. But I, I had to turn the guy down. I said, no, I can't do that because I'm just, you know, just starting to teach you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, it was, uh, it would have been a good thing to put on your resume, you know, for um, But uh, anyway, there's, uh, let's see, too much clearance between the rocker arm and the valve stem causes what? Uh, Does it cause piston slap? No. <laughs> Does it cause valve train noises? Yes. Mm, sounds good. It's not going to cause correcting rod, connecting rod noises or crankshaft knock. Mm. It's going to cause valve train noises. Clickety, 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 click. And you guys all know that this thing that uh, you've heard, uh, Chelsea, you ever heard you driving, working with your dad or whatever, you heard him talking about valve clatter, like, 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 like. I think valves is doing that. That's, that's not. It's actually, well, it's what it amounts to is whenever you've got lousy gas, the explosion's happening too soon, piston's on its way up, the thing is <laughs> sooner than it should, and it rings the piston almost like a bell. It's like somebody taking a hammer and going ding, ding, ding on the piston. 
in your here it sounds like marbles rattling around in there or something. And people call it valve clatter, but it ain't got nothing to do with a valve. You see, it's got everything to do with when the spark happens. If you have carbon buildup on the inside of the combustion chamber where it has raised the compression, it can make it fire on compression almost like a diesel too early and all that. You know what was crazy? I was working on that. Uh, I don't want to tell you this because it was kind of pertinent to this. This uh, truck of jeans, the white one that he drives, it's got that CSFI fuel system on it. That's not Gene Taylor's truck. You know, the maintenance truck. Oh, you know, the, yeah, the 2001 Chevrolet. All right, so I was going to, you know, the ignition module right there on the side. It's real easy to unplug it. It's like the ignition module is similar to the one I got on my trailer board over, but it's slightly different. But anyway, I unplugged the wires from it because I didn't want the ignition system to fire. But the engine had been sitting there running long enough for all these little glowing hot coals or, you know, the car carbon on the inside of the cylinder. And I said, okay, spin it over. They spun it over, and the thing started up dieseling. Boom, ba, doom, 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 doom. Yeah. You know, like when you shut it off? Yeah. Did you ever see that show that had Steve Gutenberg in it called Don't Tell Her It's Me? Nope. It was a funny movie. And this little gal that was in this movie, she just cued the button, but she was driving around on this ratty old Buick or something. And she parked in front of this house. It was a two-story house to go find somebody. And the whole time she was in that house, that Buick was sitting there dieseling. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> I mean, she went all the way in the house, up the stairs, down the hall, looking for whoever she was looking for. She'd come out and got in it. She switched the key back on, and it... But it was dieseling the whole time. I don't know how they did that for this movie. But it was part of the... It was funny as all. Get it. I bet I could find that scene on YouTube. But oh, it, there's a Steve Gutenberg movie called Don't Tell Her Me. But dieseling is something that happens when you've got a lot of combustion chamber buildup, you know, carbon and stuff. And then the little carbon gets really hot when the engine's running, and those coals glow red hot. And it can actually, if there's gas still going in there, and there was on that Chevrolet, say it would, you know, with the key on and the fuel pump running, if there's any movement of the engine, it'll diesel. And, I, you know, you're thinking, how can a fuel-injected engine diesel? Well, those CSF islands can. Yeah, because they got pockets in there. It'll diesel. If you got an air leak, it'll diesel, too. You know, I mean, that's why, you know, the, you got to have a... Some of those old carburetors used to have a little idle, I mean, a little th thing that shut off the idle passage. So it couldn't diesel when you shut it off. And when that thing went bad and that thing, it wouldn't open up, the car wouldn't idle. And so you'd have to screw that little thing out and pull this plunger out. When you put it back in there, it like top. Uh, okay, let's um, go down here. So somebody tell me, uh, number 15, the presence of blank under the vehicle does not indicate an external engine leak. The presence of blank under the vehicle does not indicate an external engine leak. Or no. Can be right. What about transmission and axle lubricants? Uh, Duh. That's not an engine leak. Uh, <laughs> you got to think the right way. All right, now let's whip through these uh, vocabulary max things. So we need to get out of here. We've been in, uh, we've been in here for 33 minutes and 12 seconds right now. Yeah, we, to yeah. we want to try to keep this less than 40 minutes if we're anywhere you can. And I'm going to tell it too many stories, so we need to slap off of that. Okay. Uh, 16. Produces a light knocking or pounding sound noticeable when engine speed is constant. This is left. That's I. Connecting rod bearing noise. If you kill the cylinders one at a time until the knock goes away, you can kind of tell which cylinder it's on. I got a YouTube video on that, by the way, doing that out here. Uh, another term for manifold absolute pressure test is. That is D, engine vacuum test. Manifold absolute pressure is the opposite of vacuum, so you know you add those together, you're going to get barometric pressure, right? Uh, number 18 measures engine Pyrometer. temperatures. Ooh, that's going to be a G pyrometer. All right, number 19 produces a muffled, hollow, knocking noise that is louder when the engine is cold. Beep. That is piston slap. Piston slap. Piston. This test always is performed when first measuring compression in each cylinder. Number 20, that's going to be J, dry compression test. Number 21, measures the pressure developed in the cylinder as the engine cranks. 21 is going to be a C. That is cylinder compression test. 22, all the engine parts that move with a back and forth motion are... Yeah, reciprocating mass, that's right. Um, number 23, helps isolate and amplify noises in a running engine. Number 23, automotive stethoscope. 
cost about $13 at the local parts house, and you'd be surprised how much you'll use it. However, when you first put it in your ears, don't swing around and hit that probe against something hard because it'll whack. It jars your ears. It does. It's really loud. And, um, okay, number, let's see, 24, a test that slows the condition of piston, or excuse me, shows the condition of pistons and piston rings. H is a snap throttle vacuum test. Boom. <laughs> A device that provides information about vibration frequencies, number 25, e. is, do I hear E, electronic vibration analyzer. I talked about that a little bit. And that concludes our class session for today. Everybody has a clearly defined objective and lots of work to do. Right?